My name's uh, Trevelyan Oliver, I'm a DOP. I work predominantly in sort of British TV comedy. I've been over the last few years, I kind of started working on Benidorm, and that was obviously out in Spain. And recently I did a Reluctant Landlord, which was a Sky One comedy with Romish Ranganathan, six parter. That was one of those ones where I've come from a drama background, but we wanted the, a comedy to look more like a drama, so we went for lower key stuff there, which is where I started working previously with a director called David Sant and that's who I work a lot with since then. So then I have uh, I went on and did Scarborough which was written by Darren Litton and directed by Darren who did Benidorm. So it was really nice to rework with Darren again because he's a very talented uh, writer and director. And then I did Hold the Sunset with the uh, Indomitable John Cleese, which was a lot of fun and a kind of just really nice atmosphere, good show to work on. So that was another BBC comedy. And then most recently I've shot Home, the second series of Home for Channel 4, which is about a Syrian refugee who sneaks into the country in the back of a, I suppose for want of a better word, a kind of well-to-do Dorking family's SUV. It's a lifesaver having a little A7S Mark II up in Scarborough because the majority of stuff we were on an Alexa Mini and we had a spare body that was built all ready to go on a Movi so we just chop and change between the Movi and a kind of, uh, none of it was handheld so it was all kind of dolly and head mounted. So we had these two setups which were quite kind of cumbersome if we needed to grab GVs or you know, the, basically the, biggest problem with Scarborough being in the location that it is it's not guaranteed to have beautiful weather and uh, for the opening credits you know, Darren rightly so wanted Scarborough to be looking sunny and beautiful so um, we couldn't just keep hiring a huge amount of Ari Alexa mini gear just to kind of like to grab a couple of uh, GVs every now and again so I made it my mission on there because we were over in Scarborough for a couple of weeks was a lot of the mornings and on the weekends I take the A7S out on my own and get some GVs, some nice sunrises, you know. We shot Scarborough uh, 2K, uh, all the fours pro res, but to make the A7S's footage decent enough to edit in there and grade in it, we shot it 4K. And, and it was more than enough. It was a very easy tweak with a colorist who was great um, just to kind of you know, in all honesty, just take a little bit of the sharpness out of it, but the colours were all there, colour space was nice, and it kind of held out to the titles we shot, you know, on, on an A7S, which was, I didn't think was going to be, work as well as it did. You are obviously then slightly limited to what you can do with the camera, because we didn't have, because um, we were a bit of a rogue unit, we didn't have track and dolly, or be able to do big moves, so we had to make them more kind of graphic compositions, but it worked, it was, yeah. A great little camera, yeah. I, I and I was quite surprised how how easy it was to match. Over recent years, most jobs I've I've kind of stuck to the Alexa Mini because of its its robustness. It's I know what I can push it to, and I know what I'm going to get out of it. I use Cook S4s that are really nice. They've got a good drop off because I'm doing predominantly um, TV comedy. You know, the budgets I'm not up in, they're not sort of Netflix budgets, we're not having to shoot 4K obviously, and then things become kind of more expensive. So, to be honest, most of the time I'm shooting 2K or HD, and the the quality you get out of a Mini is brilliant. And I kind of like to stick to that at the moment for those kind of jobs, because it's a, it's a very fast camera to work with. Um, I know it well, my focus puller and camera department they all know it really well so we move around quickly uh, which gives us more time to shoot so it, all in all it's a it's a very it's a very usable camera I'm kind of hopefully the next job I'd like to get my hands on a Sony Venice but you know predominantly recently it's been the Alexa Minis but you know they're, they're great chips and the stuff comes out looking looking how I imagined it you get a good representation through the monitor so if I'm lighting and operating I've got to rely quite heavy on heavily on the viewfinder to, to kind of give me an approximation of what I'm actually getting. And they're great. It's like an old jumper. You've just got used to it. I know all its forwards, I know how it works, and I know what I should be doing with it. So it takes that little sort of panic pressure off. So I can kind of concentrate on trying to make things look nicer rather than worrying about technically if the camera's capturing everything I want it to capture. 
So when, you're, when I'm working with Darren, it's really nice because I tend to kind of do a bit more of the kind of um, shot lists and storyboards so that we know how we're going to kind of construct a scene and shoot it. Because when you're shooting sort of, you know, comedies around that sort of budget, you don't, you know, there's not a huge amount of time, A, to get things wrong or, you know, to try things. So you kind of want to really want to, really want to be knowing what you're doing from the word go so i'd sit down with there and an awful lot in prep we'd send each other um you know sort of images of other shows and this other stuff that kind of like this is what i kind of this is what i'm thinking of different scripts he'd send me documentaries to watch i'd send him some images of some stills i done with a with a taken kind of just showing sort of you know contrast of face or color or any any of that sort of palette and so we checked a lot about that so that when we hit the ground running on day one um and obviously a jill got involved as well so jill ours was the producer who's lovely and um she obviously came with lots of ideas as well so between you know, the three of us would sit down and mull it all through and um when it came to shooting it i think you know we we didn't go over we never felt like we were kind of compromising on scenes because we've run out of time i think we had quite a good handle of the style and how we were going to shoot it not so much i think darren's writing he's, he's thought about it and considered it so much before and it, what what he's got on the page is you know is it is what works and it and it is and it is great and very rarely can i remember there being too many changes for things that didn't work because it generally it all worked and it all had a really lovely tone so he didn't really want to mess with that so not a there's a little bit of ad, ad libbing like as in always with comedies and and some of it's made it on screen i think and some of it doesn't but I wouldn't say it was one of those shows that was, you know, just heavy on the ad lib. It was, it was very crafted by Darren and Jill to kind of work as it, as it was as a piece. So yeah, so I got involved in the Home Series Two. Um, it's a director, uh, David Sant, who's a good friend of mine, and I did Benidorm with him, and Reluctant Landlord. So he'd, and he's great. We got on really well. We've got a good shorthand. You know, he likes it dark, I like it dark. You know, it, it just works really well. We got kind of like a a good way of working and he's also just a lovely guy and very talented. So he's great to have. So with Home, because I came in at the second series, didn't really want to ch change it to the degree of making something that looked like a totally different show, but just wanted to kind of like put, you know, my little, my little stamp on it, how I like to light and how I wanted to, you know, give, um, because I've worked with David a lot and I know he likes uh, freedom for actors to be able to move around and, and you know, and we shouldn't feel, you shouldn't, the big fan and you shouldn't feel restricted during your, um, during your performance so you can't move around or go somewhere because I think it kind of registers if everything is a bit too regimented and he's on a mark and he can't move because he's not in that bit of light. So I try to light, well I do light more, I try to light naturally from ex exterior sources big sources long way away so I've got kind of like a very natural spread through a room but because the lamps are a long way away I've got kind of you know the drop off is very even so you're not having people running into hot lamps that I've got a flag and you know they're dropping into darkness and they get you know we've got this kind of nice spread it feels like real sunlight or or night or, or whichever we're trying to create and it just I think it works because it gives freedom to get great performances because when it comes down to it it's storytelling and no matter how much you know no matter what I do with the lighting if the script or the performance is out there you're not gonna it's not gonna cut it so I'm a big fan of giving freedom trying to give freedom for directors and actors to kind of do their jobs brilliantly the, the, the Lexi Mini was it's great in low light. I mean, more often than not, I'm flagging light off. More often than not, you're out in a kind of... Particularly, we had one night we were in East City in the London, and I was kind of like, I'm not sure if I've... You know, we wrecked it the day. We didn't have quite a lot of time to work out exactly. And I was kind of concerned there was going to be, you know, not enough, not enough light there at night. Um, but, you know, obviously we brought all our own... Gear, but we wanted a big steady cam shot going down the road so you know there was a certain amount of kind of restriction that it had to work but you know in the end I ended up turning off and, and flagging street lights more than putting anything of my own in because the minis were just you know you run them at 1280 
is an ISO that I tend not to go too much above because, well, I try not to go above at all because it does get a bit noisy, but a 1280 on Cook S4s at wide open at two, there's everything there. There's more than enough. Yeah, and even if the, even if we try to risk things and have a couple of bits that are a bit too dark, bit darker, they pulled up very well. I don't, you know, it's a great camera to work with. You really, if you know what you're doing, <laughs> you know, if you're doing your job properly, which you should be, it's a it's it's a great camera. You're not going to get caught out. So we shot that Log C, all the fours, ProRes, not. 3.2k so i think we did it at 2k yeah shot it at 2k so yeah but actually the color space all the colors there it's 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 great i very there's very few moments in fact at all i can remember where i'm thinking oh i could do with a little bit more speed here or no it is and i've used because i've been using them constantly over the last i don't know five six years you know, you go into a scene with your eyes open. I know it's a night scene. We've wrecked it. I know what the camera's capable of, so I know what is enough light. There's enough illumination there. You don't want. I don't want to overlight it or kind of. As soon as you start doing it, you start flagging things off. You get funny shadows and you know. So I try to keep it relatively simple on that front. But it's about the narrative of also the blocking and, and working at how you're shooting the scene. It's not just you know making and the ability to make a still image look lovely is not does not really constitute being a DOP it's um you know you've got to really got to have a grasp on the, the whole process of telling the story and how it needs to be blocked and what you're doing with negative space or negative fill or all those things which sort of subconsciously help you tell the story that you don't often notice that you're being told, told these little bits but yeah. it's going in somehow camera operating I loved because it's a kind of it's a very it's kind of quite a selfish job you're on your own and you're kind of telling a story through a lens and you kind of don't have to get you don't get involved too much sort of politically you're kind of just you know physically there to help but since making a step to DP which I love um, but you, you find yourself it's great because you have you're more embroiled in the prep of a show so you kind of can you know, if you're working with a really good director and producer or writer, you know, you, you, you're having discussions about how, what the look needs to be, how the framing needs to be, what sort of cuts they're thinking about doing, you know, I'm all, and then I'm always thinking, you know, if they're, they're talking about having scenes with giving people lots of movement, I'm therefore automatically thinking about how I can light those scenes in a way that gives that freedom of movement. I don't want to curtail any kind of, you know, thing, any kind of instructions that we've been asked to facilitate for the script beforehand. So I'll kind of then chat with my gaffer, who's brilliant, and, um, you know, we'll kind of come up with a plan to kind of find areas to hide little things. I'm a big fan of a big source from a long way, whether that be, you know, a big 360 or a 12K or something. And then just little highlights close up or little one by ones of a bounce, just to give a little ping into the face, but trying to let the kind of trying to keep the scene as natural as possible because I think you know as viewers these days we're kind of um, we're used to all sorts of cinematic narratives and looks and I don't think and I think gone are the days where you know a really heavy blue backlight and you know something something say a little bit more kind of 70s sitcom I don't think that really cuts the mustard these days it doesn't it doesn't need to look like that we don't have to like like that because we have a lot of different sources of lighting and the cameras are better and our storytelling is kind of you know developed and progressed so it's nice to keep it always trying to keep it fresh and kind of some you know trying to kind of tell the story with some different framing so i'll sit down and work all all through the scenes with the director uh, writer producer or whoever it may be on the day it's a case of getting in there i like to be ahead of the games getting there as early as possible you know being there for the blocking um, I don't really want to kind of get involved in re-blocking for the sake of the light you know in reality I think then it starts showing to a degree you know people should be able to naturally go where they want to go as long as they you know as long as they don't naturally just walk into a, yeah. lean up against a brick wall when you've got a beautiful vista out the other way there are <laughs> parameters to that and then I try, and then it's a case of, kind of you know get the grips the grips will come in and if we're laying track or dolly we'll get that down whilst I'm um, 
you know, getting the lighting up. I'll be chatting with the focus puller about if it filters on this scene or what stop we're going to be on or if we're going to do anything high speed or different shutter, you know, so we'll kind of have that preliminary chat. Um, normally, I'm ho normally I hope within sort of, you know, half an hour, everything's up and running. They say that if you, you know, normally we try and shoot, say you've turned up on set at eight, you want to be shooting before nine. So you don't have, there's not a huge amount of time to kind of mull things over. All that should have been done a long time ago. There's a schedule and yeah. we Go. need to produce a show <laughs> at the end of that schedule. So I get all my work done earlier. So I feel, hopefully when I'm, when I'm working, I don't feel so stressed because I feel like I've got a handle on it. Yeah. But because I've kind of, you know, because I've got the, my camera department and the grips and um, the lighting department, you know, there's, there's a lot of, and I'm, always liaising constantly with the director or producer and then because I'm operating as well so I'm chatting to the actors putting marks down so it's a very concentrated time to kind of get as much as you can right as possible and it's a lot of kind of conversing with people which I really like it's a really kind of interesting melting pot of ideas and you know say well I think we might start over there and the grip might say well actually do you know what if I just came from there and round this corner a bit would that be nicer and you're like yep great idea you know so there's nothing worse than being a megalomaniac in a kind of way where you just kind of I don't I never like I never liked being an operator for DPs that are just not interested in anything anybody else has got to say you know obviously there's there's a you know you don't just go bounding up and say oh, I think you should do it this way but I like working with a crew who are bright intelligent people who like coming up who have who feel like they're you know who feel like they're part of the the crew and are worthy so they kind of Chip in. Chip in, and mm. I'm always happy to hear a little little chip in, whether it be right or wrong. It doesn't matter. It's a kind of, the fact is they're thinking about it. And mm. to be honest, that's where all our future is coming from. You know, the people are coming up through the camera department. I'm assuming that in the end, they all want to be DP. So I like to see them paying an interest in what I'm doing and asking questions, because then you feel like you're, they're learning. Otherwise, mm. what are they here for? useful bits of kit for being a DP I mean uh, I always take my light meter with me I mean I used to use it you know I use it more on film because you really got to rely on it where you know digitally on Sony Venice's and Alexis and everything you can you're judging a lot of stuff off monitors well look but I always like to have a light meter because it gives you that kind of uh, you could go into if I'm doing a big party scene in a room and you want to check that you've got very even spread all over the place so you've got kind of um, enough light in the corner for them coming through there it's you know instead of just kind of getting the camera to pan around and check all the waveform monitors on the monitor I can just walk around with the light meter and I can make sure that I've got enough ambience in the areas that I need the number's always right so you know what you're getting and so I use a light meter quite quite a lot I use Artemis an awful lot on the iPhone because it's just so much quicker than getting a finder up and changing a prime lens showing the director what about that and they go well, could we just be another you know another eight mil wider so lens off by you know artemis you can sit there i can go this is a 15 this is da, 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 da. artemis is an app that will just recreate so you put in your camera uh all your settings and the lenses you're using it's got a huge database of all the lenses you can possibly possibly want and once those are in you can just toggle between them so it just crops and, and jumps in Admittedly, you know, when you're kind of showing an example that's kind of 200 mil, it's a grainy image because you're just jumped in on the chip. But you can see the size. So it's really handy for directors that are kind of, uh, say, more kind of performance based that are not quite sure sometimes how it should look and, until they see it. But, so you can kind of, you can, you can walk around with it and you can kind of do like a steady cam move or a moving move and say, we can come in on this, you like that size, and then you can just change up and down so you, it's a real quick shorthand way of getting to the point where you know what lenses you're using where you're looking and what's happening because once you've got that decided you can get on shooting but until you've decided what you're going to be doing you know it can take ages to kind of and nobody wants to go down one route and go oh, do you know what that's not really how I imagined it mm. so the Artemis does help I'll go to the read through sometimes I go to rehearsals uh, I will always be uh, with some directors we do kind of storyboards and block out where the cameras are going to be and, and our kind of shot list 
uh, other directors would don't. It's a bit more of a kind of movable feast. You know, the iPhone, as well as having, well as being able to use Artemis, and there are other programs similar. But um, it's also great just because the fact you can you can shoot video, you can you can go to recce's and try moves and try shots and see what areas look like and see if that's a nice vista on on the lens that kind of sometimes vistas work on the lens and they don't work to the eye you know there's just some things that do or don't work so you know me and the director will often take videos you know we send them to each other he'll send me stuff he's shot before or, or just sort of frames that he likes um so the use of the iphone and other samsung whatever variables is really helpful these days to speed the process up and also it's all there on your phone so you can just go okay here's here's some references of a comedy that I liked and this is a shot that we did recently that we think is gonna gonna match in with that kind of style so you can kind of just go oh, and I like this and do you like that so you can kind of get through all that kind of mulling around process quite quickly in bizarre remote locations you haven't got to bring laptops and you know you can kind of chew it out there and then yeah. pretty much with what you've got on your phone so you it gives you that kind of head start so when you when you do actually start shooting i can't emphasize enough having a good crew the guys that the guys and girls that i work with are brilliant particularly in prep because you know we have such a shorthand of what lights we need of what camera gear and i know that's all prepped correctly you know uh, i always use you know i try to use a small pool of B camera operators, that are, you know, that are great with Steadicam as well. And I always know that I don't constantly have to be switching to their feed because I know they've got a really good natural eye and the frames are going to be looking great. Being able to work with people who naturally immediately get it in the first place is a huge time saver and a lot of and a big stress saver as well. So I don't get any nasty surprises. I've got predominantly more and more into comedies over recent years because I do I found I watch this it's what I watch most of I like comedies I think we write very good comedies in this country um, but I would there's part of me that would kind of love to do a horror film I don't know why I think it's because it's like a polar opposite to a comedy you know just I, I like to do the whole kind of the building up of the tension you know that kind of jump flick stuff and yeah. um, just just you know, even if it was a short film, I'd be really interested in having a go at that. It's interesting. It's interesting visually because they're you know, horror is something you can almost you know. If I'm watching a, watching TV, horror is you can turn the sound off and not be part of any story, and it still be terrifying. You do get a general sense. It's very visually driven story a horror. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. fun. It's but yeah, not many of them. Are, not many. Uh, there's not many horror comedies around at the moment. But I totally agree with you. I don't. You know, now kind of technically, you can make everything look real. That kind of need to show everything, I think, is just it's 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 lazy storytelling. It doesn't. You know, I think it takes a, a cleverer mind to scare somebody without just giving them a horrible image. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, I rewatched um, the Blair Witch Project recently with my son because uh, he hadn't seen it before, and he was kind of you know. Bit like, oh, it's not going to be very scary. Oh, it's only a fifteen. Oh, you know, I'm kind of, I've seen. Blah, blah, blah. And he sat down, and kind of at the end of it, he was generally, he, he was really shaky all the way through because he kind of, he, he couldn't believe how you, how drawn into a story you could get without ever, ever seeing anything really yeah. that was kind of harmful. Yeah. But you know, it's a bit. I think it was a bit of an eye opener for him to, you know, you don't just have to take the easy option and go, oh yeah, there's a monster. It's and you're getting that you know, that look of sheer terror, that your your mind just boggles about what the fact they're looking at. I don't think any cut back to whatever monstrosity they're actually seeing is ever going to be as effective as what you imagine they're seeing.